glory of the risen Lord Who can compare With the beauty of the Lord Forever He will be The Lamb upon the throne Gladly bow the knee and worship him, my Lord. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord who once was slain. Reconcile man to God Forever you will be The Lamb upon the throne I gladly bow the knee And worship you Welcome to our worship for this morning, which is Sunday the 28th of February and the second Sunday of Lent. My name is the Reverend Charlotte Cheshire and I am priest in charge of Christ Church Mould Green and St. James Rothorpe and Anglican chaplain to the University of Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. Today we'll be considering a really quite well-known phrase, at least, from a scripture. That where Christ says, take up your cross. Now, this has frequently been interpreted as just a saying to represent some of the difficult things in life we have to endure. Oh, well, that's the cross I have to bear. But when Christ actually said it, it's possible he meant that literally, and that he was talking to people who would be actually facing execution in the future. Yeah. So what does this particular scripture mean for us today? Is it metaphorical about the burdens we have to carry in this life? Or does it have a darker meaning for those who actually lose their lives for the sake of faith? Stay with us as we explore that concept in our worship this morning. But for now, I'd like to encourage you, where possible, to take a moment of quiet simply to lay aside the burdens that have been distracting you this week to allow you to focus on God in our worship this morning. And if those are burdens that actually you need to lay before God to ask him to take them so that you can focus, that's fine. But let's just have a moment of quiet now as we prepare to begin our worship for this morning. Wilderness God, as we journey through this Lent, help us to bring the whole of ourselves into the mystery of your presence. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, for you are beyond our imagination. Your ways are not our ways, for we have lost the path of love. We come to you now in our weakness and vulnerability to find in you our healing and wholeness. Meet us now in this place and time and be our guide as we find the path of your love again. Amen. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way 
and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let us pray. Glorious God, your thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are your ways our ways. You look at the ugliest soul and see still unstirred the wings of an angel. We scan the finest of our neighbours, anxious to find the flaw. You view time in the context of eternity, and so find a place for waiting, for yearning, even for suffering, even for dying. We demand instant results and look for tomorrow before savouring today. You know that only one who suffers can ultimately save. That's why you walk the way of the cross. We fear that vulnerability which defies our power. That's why we allow for crucifixion. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are your ways our ways. And yet we know yeah. that your way is the ladder to heaven. While left to our own devices, our ways slope downwards to hell. But we are here not to have our worst confirmed, but to have our best liberated. So we pray. Forgive in us what has gone wrong. Repair in us what is wasted. Reveal in us what is good, and nourish us with better food than we could ever purchase. Your word, your love, your inspiration, your daily bread for our life's journey. In the company of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. a place where mercy reigns and never dies there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white
God the Father who brings good news of forgiveness, forgive you for the times you have failed to show his love. God the Son who brings healing and wholeness, remake you in the image of his love. God the Holy Spirit, fill you with her renewed joy, knowing that you can start again, accepting God's offer of love and reflecting it to all whom you meet. Amen. And so let's pray our collect prayer for today. God of our deepest selves, as we walk with Jesus in the wilderness, as we face our fears and doubts, as we leave behind all that has weighed us down, may we tread with lightened step through the 40 days of Lent, knowing that we are dust and to dust we shall return, but will come to Easter filled with joy, knowing that we are loved and meant for life with you forever. Amen.
A reading from Mark 8, verse 31 to the end. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any one to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. And so may I speak and may you hear in the name of the one who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder what springs to mind when you hear the phrase, take up your cross. Maybe you might have a memory of someone saying, Sigh, well, that's just the cross I have to bear. It's a saying they usually mean to indicate that they're having a hard time in some kind of circumstance and they don't see a way out, so they just have to bear with it. It's a phrase that's come to signal a combination of hard times, perseverance and tenacity. Or... Maybe when you hear that phrase, take up your cross, it might actually bring a different impression to mind. Maybe you might think about taking up your cross as quite literally wearing a cross to denote being a Christian or a disciple of Christ. Or Perhaps it might have more of a catch-all meaning for you, that no matter what comes your way, you will uphold and speak of your faith as you take up your cross by publicly affirming what you believe. That phrase of taking up your cross has become quite common, and it now means different things to different people. There are plenty who would use the phrase now without any particular reference to faith or Christianity, but, you know, just to indicate those figurative or literal burdens in their life. But that phrase, common as it is, does come directly from the Bible passage that Angeline just read for us. But what does it actually mean for us today? Well, first of all, I'd like to take a step or two backwards because this week's reading, as set by the lectionary, sounds as though it starts in the middle of a scene as it opens with, then he began to teach them. Well, wait, 
what comes before the then? If something happens then, it's necessary that something else must have happened first. So what was that? Well, go back three verses to verse 27. And this is the moment when Jesus asks his disciples who people say that he is. And they respond, John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. While Peter makes his declaration of faith in saying, you are the Messiah. Jesus hears this, tells them not to share it with anyone else, and then the scene continues. Then he began to teach them. I think a context like that is important because otherwise it would seem as though Jesus was just randomly launching into a prediction about his death, which, let's face it, would be a bit odd. But when read in context, this makes a little bit more sense. Who am I? You're the Messiah. Okay, but be prepared, because I'm not like any other Messiah you might have known. Because, you see, the two sections of that passage are linked, and they make more sense when they're read together. But having established that, let's move on to what Jesus is telling his friends. On the one hand, he's just drawn a deep and profound confession of faith from them, but then he's immediately overturning any and all of their preconceptions of what being a Messiah must be. So for that, we need to consider what the disciples would have believed a Messiah was. Messiah was the promised one who would deliver the Jewish nation from her oppressors, as prophesied in the scriptures for generations previously. This was a triumphant figure, a warrior figure, a liberator. A messiah is regarded as the savior of a particular country or cause, and in some circumstances, the phrase is still used today to indicate a figurehead or someone who helped others in impossible circumstances. But this in itself caused a problem because a triumphant messiah is powerful. If he's bringing freedom to a nation or a people, then his followers must be responding to a call to arms, to stand and fight for the person or cause they believe in. We see that in the not too distant future when Jesus is arrested and Peter's first reaction is to pull out his sword and to fight the crowd. But Jesus is trying to warn his followers that his version of being a Messiah looks quite different to their preconceptions. In essence, he's telling them, you may well believe that I'm the Messiah, but you need to understand that this isn't some kind of victorious quest for glory. You're not following a conquering soldier. You're following and putting your faith in someone who's going to be arrested, rejected, and killed. There's no glory at the end of this story. No earthly crowns or acclaim. You need to understand and accept what you're getting into here. And unsurprisingly, Peter immediately rebukes Jesus for saying these defeatist things. We're not told exactly what Peter said, but it's not really hard to imagine. Jesus, what are you saying? How can you talk of arrest, rejection, and death? We will fight. We will fight for you. You'll see we'll win this. Peter can't take himself out of the traditionally expected narrative of a conquering Messiah. He can't envisage a suffering Messiah. To me, at a very human level, it seems like Peter is trying to protect his friend from harm and to promise to stand by him. But instead of being touched by this kindness, Jesus turns on Peter 
rebuking him and telling Satan to get behind him. That must have hurt. But while to us Jesus' words may sound harsh, unkind, I think you have to dig a little bit deeper here to see both the humanity and the divinity of Christ. Because in his divine nature, Jesus knows he's going to suffer, to die and to be raised to new life once more. He understands how this fits in to God's plan of salvation. But in his humanity, his human side, remembering that Christ was both fully God and fully man, he must have been terrified of the suffering that he was about to endure, perhaps even tempted to use his miraculous powers to effect an escape. Remember the temptation in the wilderness with which we began our marking of the season of Lent. When the devil suggests that Jesus could throw himself down from the highest point in Jerusalem and God's holy angels would rescue him. This is that kind of temptation moment. Jesus is seeing something an awful lot deeper in Peter's comment than just a friend trying to protect him. And he responds accordingly not just by rebuking Peter, but by rejecting the temptation to stray from the path that has been set before him. And what's more, Jesus then goes on to make it clear to anyone who wants to follow him, to be his disciple, that they must understand what they're getting into. This isn't the story of an easy earthly victory. This isn't a straightforward, happy ending. Even though he does say he will rise again after three days, that must have triggered such confusion that it would have been easy to dismiss or skate over. But the one thing the people listening to Jesus' words that day definitely would have understood was the vision of carrying a cross. Those in the audience listening to Jesus' words would have been all too familiar with Roman executions in which those sentenced to death were required to quite literally carry their cross through the streets on the way to the place of their execution, facing ridicule along the way. 2,000 years later, Christians view the cross as a cherished symbol of atonement, forgiveness, grace, and love. But in Jesus' day, the cross represented nothing but a torturous death. There was nothing of decorative jewelry about it. And sometimes I wonder if the wearing of crosses as a symbol of our faith in the way that we do might have diminished something of its power or lost a bit of its meaning. We often associate this idea of taking up our cross today with a symbolic burden we bear or a challenge we face in this life. And a common saying is, that's the cross I have to carry. But when Jesus carried his cross up to Golgotha to be crucified, no one was thinking of the cross as symbolic of a physical, emotional or circumstantial burden to carry through life. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. Death by the most painful and humiliating means that human beings could develop. So, on the one hand, Jesus is speaking directly to his 12 disciples, and he's foreshadowing not only his death on the cross, but also their deaths. It's a matter of historic record that many of Jesus' early followers lost their lives for their faith. 
The list is actually quite horrific. Stephen was stoned. James and Barnabas were killed. Matthew and Paul were killed by the sword. James and Matthias were beaten and stoned. Mark was dragged to pieces. Thomas was speared. Luke was hanged. Andrew, Philip, Jude, Bartholomew, Simon and Peter were all crucified. It's a horrific list. And sadly, as we know, the list of martyrs who have lost their lives through the centuries, rather than deny their faith, has grown to epic proportions. So, on the one hand, Jesus is talking to these people and saying, are you really willing to endure this to follow me? Is it really worth it? He's posing them a very literal and a very important question. But on the other hand, I believe that Jesus was also talking to us, his later followers or disciples, if you prefer. Because the literal definition of disciple is one who embraces and assists in spreading the teaching of another. It comes from the Latin disciplus, meaning pupil and deceer to learn. And I think that's interesting because that definition shows that being a disciple is not just being a follower, someone passive. It's also a spreader, someone who spreads or shares the teaching of another. But in the context of taking up the cross, it would appear that this is about doing so regardless of the cost and regardless of the interruption or change to our plans along the way. And you know, that idea of having our plans changed is, I think, really quite significant to where we are at this moment in time. I wonder if you realized that when Jesus started talking about his own death, his popularity sank like a stone. Many of his shocked followers rejected and deserted him because they couldn't get over the difference between their own ideas, plans and desires for what a Messiah meant and what a Messiah would do in order to exchange them for the reality that Jesus was talking about. Following Jesus or honouring our faith is relatively easy when life runs smoothly, but it's an awful lot harder when our plans are summarily or abruptly changed. And over this last year, gosh, but how many of our plans expectations and hopes and dreams have been completely overturned or even shattered. Our church buildings have been closed along with all other public buildings. We've been confined to our homes for weeks and months on end. We've been asked to worship in new, completely different and alien ways that we could never have imagined before the pandemic. And on the one hand, some are talking about the thousands of people who have begun to worship precisely because church has become more accessible online, while many others are talking about those who have fallen away from their faith and may never return because they've gotten out of the habit of coming to a physical building for church. Others over this last year have faced incredible losses, bereavements, shattered hopes and expectations as a result of everything that the pandemic has brought our way. And when that happens, it can be immensely difficult to cling on to our faith instead of simply sinking into the greyness of apathy and depression. Sure, that's not the same as being martyred for our faith. Of course it isn't. But there are some ways in which there's also a form of glory or recognition in martyrdom that there just isn't in the slow seeping away of the pandemic. I guess what I'm getting at 
is those of us who have faith have a particular sense of what that looks like, how it will feel, how we will practice it. And that isn't too different from those in the audience when Jesus said those first words. They expected one thing of a Messiah, and they were getting something completely different. For many, it was just too difficult to cling on, and it was easier to walk away. I wonder how many of you might be feeling rather like the crowd who couldn't reconcile the difference between their plans and expectations and the reality that was facing them. I wonder if, for you, the concept of taking up your cross, whatever that might mean, just seems too difficult right now. Will you come back? Can you come back? This particular season in the church year is, of course, that of Lent. Traditionally, it's a time when we give something up, something we enjoy or rely on, in favour of extra time spent in prayer or otherwise with God. But for so many this year, that just feels impossible. And understandably so, because we've already involuntarily given up so much. But I wonder if, in the silence and quiet of these remaining weeks of lockdown, you might be able to examine that concept in yourself of your expectations of faith, of Jesus, and of discipleship. What did you think it would mean when you joined up? What does it appear to mean now? What do you think it might mean in the future? And perhaps most importantly of all, will you still be here, taking up your cross and calling yourself a disciple, no matter how many of your expectations are overturned by following this Messiah. I hope and pray that you will, just like I hope and pray that I will see you all soon. Amen. Thank you.
So as we have considered the love that is freely given to everyone without cost, but at great price, we respond to that love by confirming our faith. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with her power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So let us pray for all who are struggling today with the depths of stress, depression, or other mental ill health out of the depths. We cry to you, O oh God. For all who are facing their mortality today with illness or bad news out of the depths, we cry to you, O oh God. For all who are bereaved today, knowing that we are dust, that we may know we are also much loved out of the depths, we cry to you, O oh God. For all who make resolutions today, who long for change in their lives and for resolve to keep them out of the depths, we cry to you, O oh God. We leave with God our thorns and briars, all that we have let go of today, and we trust God to receive them and to hold on to them, for we shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. We leave with God the voices of negativity, all that continues to undermine us, and we trust God to receive them and to hold them, for we shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. We offer to God our hidden selves, all that we hope and dream for, and we trust God to receive them and to hold them, for we shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. We listen for God's word of affirmation, that we are God's children, loved and called, and we dare to trust in that voice above all others, for we shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. So now, as Jesus taught us, so we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. There I 
find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul Rest in your embrace For I am yours You are mine Your grace abounds in deep as war surrounds me You've never failed And you won't stop now I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise my soul Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander My faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Saviour Spirit lead me when my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Saviour Trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander My faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior God makes peace within us. Let us claim it. God makes peace between us. Let us share it. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. And so as our service comes to a close for this morning, we ask for God's blessing to be upon us. 
God who loves us to our very depths, Jesus who saves us from our very worst, Spirit who moves us to become our true selves, bless us now and through all the days of Lent and bring us to her life in love. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. His face.